Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is David Sanders. I'm a professor at the School of Public Health. I'm now only part-time. I was the founding director of the school, and I've been very involved in the development of this primary health care course. So today I'm going to speak about uh, the background to the history of and the evolution of comprehensive primary health care. It is just an overview, and you have readings which will go into this material in much more detail. So I'm not going to cover all of the items specified on this slide. I'm only really going to deal with the first bullet, the rationale for and the history of the evolution of CPHC, i.e., Comprehensive Primary Health Care. So, although this is my first slide, I'm going to preface it by talking firstly about the fact that before Western medicine or modern medicine arrived in the global south, Africa, Asia, Latin America, and so on, it, of course, um, was a, there were already in these countries, and still are, traditional health systems. The traditional health systems vary, of course, from continent to continent and even between countries. But in Southern Africa, where I'm most familiar with it, and I'm no expert, in Southern Africa, traditional health care consists of a number of different components. So uh, traditional healers usually include herbalists, people who use herbal traditional remedies often to treat particular illnesses or symptoms. There are people who specialize, for example, in bony problems, fractures and so on, bone setters if you like. Then, of course, there are traditional midwives who still practice in many African countries and indeed in Asian countries. They're often relatives of um, the pregnant woman and they give advice about pregnancy they help at childbirth, they assist in deliveries, and they're often involved also in basic child care. Then there are um, traditional healers who deal mainly with mental health or psychological problems. So these are people who are often uh, spiritualists, who claim to communicate with ancestors, and often are the people that are gone to to try and explain why a particular health problem uh, has affected that person. Did they offend uh, relatives or the ancestors and so on? So these systems have existed for many centuries. And of course, they still continue. So even today, um, in African countries, including in South Africa, People will often use both systems, the modern system and the traditional system, for different things. So, primary health care, which we're talking about today, the advent of um, modern primary health care, was preceded, of course, by what are termed colonial health services. So with colonization, which occurred, of course, in uh, the 19th and early 20th century, and indeed even before that, with the arrival of missionaries, generally um, colonial health services followed the same kind of um, architecture and pattern as in the colonizing country. So, for example, um, British colonies had approaches to healthcare which really mirrored what existed in the UK at the time. Indeed, if you go into 
many old district hospitals, you will find that they are designed in the same kind of way as small hospitals, cottage hospitals in parts of the UK. So generally, colonial health services were primarily for the colonial population, the settler population in some countries. So they tended to be um, concentrated in urban centers, in, um, sometimes in agricultural centers where there are lots of farmers, or near mines. And um, they generally consisted of fixed facilities, that is, hospitals, sometimes clinics, and they tended not to reach very far out into the hinterland where most of the population, the indigenous population, lived. They were very curative in their emphasis. They emphasized treatment so people would come to the healthcare facilities once they were already sick. And preventive services only developed a little bit later, and they tended to be focused on particular diseases. So, for example, malaria, which affected and continues to affect most African and many Asian countries and some Latin American countries, malaria was a scourge. Um, of both the local population, but especially the colonialists. And so malaria control programs were developed, and often they had what we call a vertical structure. Not only were they focused on a particular single disease, in this case malaria, but they had their own staff, their own equipment, their own transport, and people like malaria control officers were trained just in the control of malaria, which back in the day really consisted primarily of spraying, indoor spraying of people's dwellings, but also of clearing of swamps and bush and so on. And there were such vertical programs also for other endemic diseases, such as sleeping sickness, such as leprosy, and so on. And often these services, the preventive services, came under a different administration. So, for example, in uh, pre independence Zimbabwe, um, these preventive services fell under provincial offices of health, whereas the hospitals, the clinics, and the mainly curative services tended to fall under the central government. So colonial health services were operated both by the colonial government but also by missions, mostly Christian missions. And they were similar in their um, architecture and in their um, overall uh, their overall thrust, namely mainly curative. Mission services tended, though, to be somewhat better placed in relation to the population. So if you look at, even today, the distribution in Zimbabwe of mission district hospitals or in Malawi, they tend to be in areas of great population density, whereas often the colonial services were not. So with decolonization in the 60s and 70s, and for some, some countries in southern Africa, even the 80s, um, the advent of post-colonial governments, often having been led by liberation movements, were accompanied by big investments and policies in the social sectors. So there was a great expansion in many countries immediately after independence of education services, of health services, and so on. It became clear that most, sometimes the majority of people in, uh, in uh, these countries were not able to access health services. 
And so um, there was a big uh, push to extend health services beyond the cities and industrial or agricultural areas where they were located. And um, the first uh, international um, policy-making event, at least one that's been documented, um, about a different approach to healthcare occurred in a conference held in Uganda in the early 1960s, early to mid-1960s, out of which emerged a book, Medical Care in Developing Countries, edited by Morris King, and had chapters in it written by people who mostly had practiced in colonial medical services or in mission health services. And these, this book really was about what we now call basic health care. Basic health care, or basic medical care as it was called, really focused attention on the peripheral facilities, on health centers as the key facility around which services should be organized. Of course, there were hospitals above these health centers, which we now call district hospitals, and often satellite clinics below these health centers. But this book, Medical Care in Developing Countries, spelled out the rationale for and the way to organize such health services. And it truly is a classic and fed into the development of primary health care. It was soon followed by a book edited by Jukanovic and Match, came out of WHO, and it was about a basic health system with a focus on health centers. So it was very similar to the King book, but this was WHO's official policy position, and this was really in um, the early 1970s, in the lead-up to the Alma Ata conference. So in addition to these publications and policies, there was the work of social epidemiologists. Perhaps the best known is Thomas McEwen, and then there was McKinley in the US. Thomas McEwen, really, he was a professor of uh, public health, but he analyzed data which were kept from 1838 by the Registrar General in England and Wales, which documented in great detail and precision the causes of death by social class, by five different social classes, ranging from unskilled laborer to professional. And it documented the change in uh, the burden of disease measured by mortality rates, and also, in some cases, by morbidity, number of cases of disease. Uh, the change in this, and also the change in the disease pattern. So, McEwen is famed, really, for this particular graph, which is perhaps the most important figure in public health. Because what this shows based on the data for respiratory TB in England and Wales from 1838, what it shows is a dramatic decline in the death rate of tubercul from tuberculosis from 1838 down to the late 1960s, early 1970s. And what you can see here is that this decline in deaths occurred before it was known what caused TB and long before there was any effective treatment for TB. Chemotherapy with streptomycin only in the 90, late 1940s and BCG vaccination 
even later. So what this tells us, and there are similar graphs for other conditions, both respiratory as well as food and water-related diseases, such as diarrheas, what this tells us is that there were factors other than healthcare interventions which led to an improvement in the health of uh, the English and Welsh population. And we have, of course, covered that in a previous lecture, but in essence, the improvements that resulted in a drop in mortality and disease morbidity were to do with improvements in the social and economic environment, better living and working conditions. And these resulted from a complex process of uh, increased wealth in the UK, partly from exploitation of the colonies, but also from the agricultural and industrial revolutions, which really mechanized agriculture and industry. And with that, Britain became wealthy, and with certain social struggles, which are depicted here, this is a poster from 1832, a real poster, and you can see it's signed by Salus Populi, the health of the people. This is a social movement, if you like, which is complaining about death uh, in Lambeth, a suburb of South London, which they attribute to the main thoroughfares being without common sewers. In other words, due to unsanitary conditions. So, of course, this could be about Kailicha or an informal settlement in South Africa or another country in Africa today. And they say that unless something is done to allay the growing discontent of the people, retributive justice will take place. And they say they will use the lamp iron and the halter, which are instruments of torture. So this is a very serious and militant social movement. So you have increased wealth in England and Wales. You have people driven off the land into the towns by the agricultural revolution essentially is parallel to South Africa's Land Act in 1913, and lots of unemployed uh, homeless people living in the cities. Then comes the Industrial Revolution. Many people are absorbed into industry, but very dangerous and unhealthy working conditions. And, of course, the new cities cannot cope with this influx of the population, so you actually get an increase in death rates. People protest, this shows, over several decades, and in the late 1800s, 1870s onwards, really, you get a whole lot of social reforms enacted. The public health laws, which protect working and living conditions, which... Uh, uh, have to do with controlling pollution, uh, dust <coughs> in factories, and um, against child labor and so on and so forth. So with the improvement in people's nutritional status and living and working conditions, we have that happening. So, there is this component, an understanding of essentially the social epidemiology of disease and the experiences of post-colonial health services, which feed into the development of the primary health care approach. So, a very important book came out of WHO edited by Professor Ken Newell, 1975. And what that did was to describe several community-based projects, and within these, the role of community-based workers, who were variously called village health workers, 
promotores de salud, promoters of health in Latin America, and other community-level workers who are based in these large, often, uh, usually NGO-led uh, community-based projects in, in a number of countries. There are descriptions in this book of such community-based projects in Bangladesh, in Guatemala, in Niger, in West Africa, and others. And these cases that are documented in this book all showed great improvements in health, particularly in child health. Also in the book were large-scale and country experiences of primary health care. And really the most exciting one, and the largest, was the description of what had happened in China since its liberation in 1949, through the 50s, 60s, and into the 70s. Now, news of China only started to come out to the West in the early 1970s. And it was truly remarkable what had happened to health in China. Because China, which had started in a similar place to India, which, of course, achieved independence at about the same time from British rule, the differences were truly remarkable because they both started with very high um, levels of infant and child and maternal mortality, many communicable diseases, uh, violent injury, and so on and so forth, where, whereas China had had a dramatic drop in these conditions and India a much slower one. So this book by Newell, and there were other countries, Tanzania was another case study documented in this book. So this book was very influential in the lead up to Alma Art. Now one of the experiences that Newell did not describe, and many argue, was really the main root, the main source of the primary health care approach, was the work done in South Africa, actually, in the 1940s, by Sydney and Emily Cock, who were doctors who practiced in an area called Polela in Zululand at the time. So Sydney and Emily Cock uh, uh, worked in a health center <coughs> in Polela, and <coughs> they soon came to realize that the health problems that they were dealing with had their source in the community, in the living and working conditions that people found themselves in. And in fact, they, in their writings, exemplify this by talking about <clears throat> sexually transmitted diseases which they trace, and this has lessons for today, which they trace to the mining industry, where men from Zululand would go and work in the mines, they'd contract sexually transmitted diseases, they'd come back, they'd transmit them to their wives, and the clinic was inundated with cases, but was not addressing the source, the social determinants of this problem. So they developed what came to be called community-oriented primary care. The primary care part of it was the basic care in the clinic, but also with outreach workers, we now call community health workers, and undertaking community diagnosis to define the causes of the problem uh, and to try to address those through intersectoral action. So it's interesting that the Newell book does not document the Sydney and Emily Clark experience, but that also is part of the evidence base for primary health care. So in 1978, the famous Alma Ata conference was held. And this is a photograph of the hall in Alma Ata, now called Almaty, in Kazakhstan, which was one of the republics of the Soviet Union. 
So you can see they're taking a, a break. Um, many people smoking, that's changed a bit. And mostly men in suits, and that's also changed a bit. But this is the Alma Ata Conference, which pledged to reach the target of health for all by the year 2000 and produced the seminal document called the Alma Ata Declaration on Primary Health Care. So, what is primary health care? This is necessarily abbreviated and superficial, but you do have readings about this. So there are five principles to the primary health care approach. Equitable access. That is, accessibility and coverage on the basis of need. So equity is not the same thing as equality. Equity implies that those who have greater needs get more services. Secondly, comprehensive care, with an emphasis on disease prevention and health promotion. I'll come back to that, but comprehensive care includes treatment and rehabilitation as well. Then, community and individual involvement and self-reliance. And I will talk a little bit later about community participation. Intersectoral action to address the social and environmental determinants of health. And finally, cost-effective and appropriate technology. And of course, there are many different technologies which we know about now. And even at the time of Alma Ata, there were many important technologies which were promoted by the PHC approach. So these principles run through primary health care. And they are embodied in the different elements or programs of primary health care. So there were eight elements. The first is really about the social determinants, promotion of proper nutrition, adequate supply of safe water and basic sanitation, and other things. A big focus on maternal and child care, including family planning. Immunization against major infectious diseases. Prevention and control of locally endemic diseases, such as malaria. Health education and methods of prevention and control and treatment for common diseases and injury. So this is a summary, but it's clear. There are some programs to address particular health problems that are missing. One of them, clearly, is non-communicable disease. This list doesn't talk about chronic and non-communicable diseases. Of course, at that time, HIV was not known, but problems of heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, and so on, were known about, but were not as common as they are today in the global south, Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Of course, primary health care is an approach which is global. All, I think it was 192 member states of WHO at the time, endorsed primary health care, albeit reluctantly on the part of some, notably the United States. Um, so primary health care was not just for low- and middle-income countries, yet the neglect of NCDs uh, suggests that this really was an approach primarily for poor countries. So primary health care <clears throat> has really got two parts to it. First of all, a strategy to respond more equitably, appropriately, and effectively
to basic health care needs. That's, in a way, the input from the basic medical services approach in the King book. But the other very important component of primary health care was and is to address the underlying social, economic, and political causes, what we now call the social determinants of poor health. So there was talk in the Alma Ata Declaration about many important principles, and I've just pulled out this quote, which is prophetic in a way. It really was quite prescient. You could see what was coming. They say it can be seen that the proper application of primary health care will have far-reaching consequences, not only throughout the health sector, but also for other social and economic sectors at community level. It will greatly influence community organization in general. Resistance to such change is only to be expected. And of course, ever since the PHC declaration, there has been resistance. Resistance from the medical fraternity, often terming it second-class medicine for the poor, resistance from medical big business, particularly the pharmaceutical corporation, and often resistance from associations and professional bodies. So, when we use the term comprehensive, and it is used in the Alma Ata Declaration, what we mean is addressing health problems by providing a combination of promotive, preventive, curative or treatment, and rehabilitative services accordingly. So, Primary medical care, care that is delivered in clinics, health centers, and so on, is part of, but not the whole of, primary health care because primary medical care generally involves only treatment and sometimes personal prevention, i.e. health education or immunization, but it does not really engage with the social determinants, i.e. the promotive role. So, primary health care is a combination of individually focused activities and population focused activities. So, rehabilitation and treatment clearly are directed at the individual. Whereas, Preventive and promotive actions are really about population health, about public health. Public health is about prevention and promotion. So what do we mean by these terms, particularly promotion? Because that's often what students are confused about. So a promotive approach addresses the social determinants through, for example, advocacy and lobbying of government and policy makers by legislative actions like anti-smoking legislation, as well as by intersectoral interventions directed at households or communities. And I would add now, um, with the advent of globalization, intersectoral interventions that occur at the policy level. For example, interventions to regulate, for example, alcohol or the food system. So, comprehensive primary health care comprises both individual clinical care and public health interventions. 
And it's really for this reason that we at the School of Public Health, UWC, teach about primary health. Many schools of public health don't teach about primary health. Okay? But we believe, and we believe that the Alma Ata Declaration and the meaning of primary health care okay, does incorporate an important public health component. So, to end, <clears throat> this is to illustrate uh, what would be a comprehensive approach to the management of a common illness, diarrheal disease. Not everything's on here, and clearly this is very sketchy because it doesn't talk about the processes. For example, community participation. But if we are to adequately address diarrhea in a sustainable way, and to prevent its future occurrence, there need to be actions in all of these. So you all know that treatment of diarrhea, really more accurately, treatment of dehydration, is the use of oral rehydration therapy. Essentially, water, sugar, and salt, sometimes packaged with some other ingredients. And at the same time, nutrition support, especially continued breastfeeding for the infant. And then after the attack of diarrhea, because often children who get diarrhea and who suffer worse are undernourished or become undernourished, rehabilitation consists at least of nutrition rehabilitation. So the preventive interventions are about personal and food hygiene, helping the mother to understand how enteric infections are transmitted, and that has to do with hand washing, correct preservation of food, and so on. And then measles vaccination is important. Uh, was much more important at the time of the Alma Ata Declaration uh, when measles was more common than it is now, but it remains important. Breastfeeding, an exceptionally important way to prevent diarrheal disease. And now we have a new vaccine, the rotavirus vaccine. So these are some, not all, of the preventive activity. And finally, how would we address the social determinants of diarrhea? Well, clearly, we need to improve the environment, especially the sanitary environment terms of water supply, sufficient clean water, especially for hand hygiene, sanitation, and household food security. Because as I mentioned earlier, uh, undernutrition and diarrhea go together. This really is for another talk uh, when we will study what we now call selective primary health care, but I hope that what I've covered so far gives you a background to and some of the key aspects of comprehensive primary health care. Thank you. <laughs>